Okay, we'll uh, make a start. So, uh, welcome to uh, this evening's engineering group meeting uh, on the international perspectives on integration of geotechnical risk management and project risk management. Uh, we're also webcasting tonight, so uh, welcome to anybody joining us online. So, tonight's uh, presentation by uh, Paul Malifants, um basically goes through his uh, inputs uh, for the uh, into the 2013 UK country reports for the integration of geotechnical risk management, project management, project risk management, and this was an input into the uh, international state of the art report of the same title by the uh, International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. Paul has a quite quite, quite varied uh, career so far, starting in, in the uh, mining and moving into civil and ground engineering in the 1990s, working on a variety of buildings, infrastructure, highways and site development schemes. Also a champion of the, uh, the ROJEP uh, registered ground engineering professionals. But he's also currently working on the uh, Cardiff Capital Regional Metro. So he's going to basically take us through his work uh, on this report. And uh, hopefully we'll have some questions and uh, discussion at the end just to get, uh, get the uh, thoughts on it locally and uh, from around the world. So, and with Paul. Thanks for that, Tom. Um, I, I did contemplate trying to make a really snappy um, topic title, but I really couldn't think of one linked in with the, the title of the research that we've been doing and the, the international work. So, um, unfortunately, I've probably scared off half the audience, but um, Hopefully the people who are here and who are online will find something interesting in what I have to say. Um, in part, I feel that this is actually a reporting back exercise from research that I, I was uh, championing last year uh, because the, uh, there was a sort of a call for evidence from the industry and uh, a few people did uh, respond and join in. So there's a, an element of reporting back. There's an element of, of building on the BGA talk that I gave with Paul Cool from the ne Netherlands last May. Uh, and also uh, looking forward uh, in discussion with you guys um, as to what we do next. So uh, if I look at uh, what we're going to do this evening, um, firstly, I, I'm going to introduce the, well, I'm not even going to try and read that. That's almost as bad as my own company, CH2M Hill, um, that lot. Um, uh, then looking at the st international state-of-the-art report, some interim conclusions, and then I'm going to uh, put a few thoughts on uh, UK perspectives, um, and then a bit of a discussion of where we go from here as an industry. So uh, the International Society of Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering were the hosts, as it were, for this research. Uh, this uh, was completed under their Technical Committee 304 Engineering Practice on Risk and Assessment and Management. They were the particular imp uh, view on the impact on society. Uh, and their task force three was looking at trying to do some broader coordination uh, with the wider risk management community. Um, so the hypothesis that they had, uh, which actually came out, I think, probably for some work in, in Holland uh, in recent times with GeoImpulse, and I'll touch on them later, um, is that the current position is that geotechnical risks are managed uh, out with project risks. Uh, and that actually what we should be doing is having geotech risks well and truly embedded as a subset of project risk. And I think probably most people, uh, when they look at it in that form, would probably agree. Um, but I think possibly we've also got a lot of experience amongst us of where we've just been given a problem and please go away and solve it, uh, as opposed to joining in with the team and saying, well, is that the right problem to solve? Or for the project, is there something better we can do? So we had 10 countries in total joined in with this exercise. Um, they are named in there in the broadly alphabetical order, if you go down the left and then down the right. Um, championed by uh, uh, the Netherlands. Um, and the UK report was uh, undertaken by myself. And the international report was it, uh, issued uh, last December at the conference in Hong Kong. Um, that uh, report um, is I think now already on the engineering group's website. Um, the international state of the art report is part one, and part two is actually all ten of the UK of the country reports. So uh, the whole data set, as it were, is, is there for anybody to see. 
Um, the Martin Stavenen in uh, Holland, when he analyzed everything, he was looking at uh, trying to collate all the information and come up with some common threads. And he looked at um, issues and summarized them together uh, into three broad uh, recommendation areas and so on. So the first one was organizational structure. There was an issue there which was um, basically a problem of organizational structure uh, of the team that was involved in the construction project. Uh, there was uh, then those which were more to do with the organization's culture and how they uh, all went about risk management. Uh, and then others that were very much of a technical nature. So if I just want to flip through just the top three um, problems uh, and issues and so on that were covered in, in each area. Um, and unfortunately, I can't read everything on there, so I'm just going to have to flip my piece of paper down the bottom here where I want to read something. So if we look at project risk management, um, the first slide here is the top three issues that uh, by percentage of countries that actually had something in their report which resonated with a particular issue um, of the value that the project risk management brings to construction schemes. Uh, number one there was a reduction of probability of failure and minimizing failure cost. Uh, the second was all about communication. And the third one um, was increasing the acceptability of the project amongst the public. Uh, that was the only one that wasn't really picked up within the UK report. If we then look at the hurdles to delivering that value, um, the report then looked at, uh, at the top three there. The first one was return on investment. There was a recognition that internationally, uh, six, six out of 10 countries were flagging up that actually they didn't really understand the return on investment of doing project risk management. The second one was back down to an element of communication. Um, so it was people trying to hide risks and problems instead of communicating them with the parties, uh, sharing that knowledge and working out how we can actually deal with them. And the third one there was a risk averse culture actually flagging up that maybe people are putting a high value on health and safety um, and certainty. And of course, ground engineering, it's very difficult to provide any certainty in, uh, in, in our business. We're, we're always dealing with uncertainty and risk. Um, and you'll note that none of those are technical. Every single one of them was either organizational structure or organizational culture. If we have a look at the solutions that the international report came up with, um, and the UK was aligned with all of these. Um, once again, all organizational, not technical. Uh, there seemed to be a general understanding, and maybe this is because the reporters were technical in their own right. I don't know, and they were always blaming something else. Uh, you can always look at bias in the, uh, in the game. But uh, the issues that they flagged up there uh, was uh, education in project risk management so that all parties actually understood the value. Um, best value procurement, how construction was uh, procured. Uh, and then another element of communication. And of course, you could argue that education itself is actually communication. It's communication of knowledge from one party to another. And it's interesting that um, a seminar I ran here uh, in this building last uh, in February 2012 where we had a look at construction risk. We had speakers from a number of different professional areas, including insurance. And the insurance industry flagged up that um, they put a lot of their risk, their assessment of uh, risk from the point of view of providing cover, insurance cover for major projects, by looking at team competence and communication. Um, and this, these um, results are probably mirroring that. And the reason for that, uh, from uh, their point of view, is actually those are the highest two uh, factors, non-technical factors, that influence insurance claims uh, in the construction industry is some issue to do with the competence of the team uh, or some issue to do with how that team is actually communicating. Uh, and if you look at it from another way, if you've got a highly competent team that's darn good at communicating, they'll probably solve anything you throw at them. So maybe there's a simple logic in there. So that was project risk management. So if we look now at um, 
uh, the same sort of set of slides, the same logic for geotechnical risk management. Uh, you'll see there the first slide talks about the, the value that risk, geotechnical risk management brings to the, to the game. Uh, so avoiding time cost overruns, uh, minimizing geotechnical risk to construction staff, and so on. 70% um, of the countries that responded were picking that issue up. Uh, management of uh, identified risks to ensure sustainable and safe design uh, was the second one there, and reduction of conflicts and contractual issues and claims. Uh, and it's interesting that all of this is backing up the fact that uh, things that frustrate us in this country um, frustrate people all around the world uh, in ground engineering. So maybe there's a, some common threads there. And part of the issue here was actually looking to see whether there were lessons that we could learn off each other. If we look then at the top three hurdles to delivering that value, uh, again, top of the heap was uh, return on investment. Understanding that actually geotechnical risk management, people believe it costs money, um, but where's the evidence that it saves a whole chunk of money? Um, what's the return on investment? Uh, and 80% of the countries that responded were picking up this issue of we don't quite understand it. Um, the second one there, uh, lack of recognition of geo-risks by clients. Um, various elements all linked into education and communication again, 80% yet again. Um, and the third one there, um, something that uh, we probably all know a lot about, is actually getting us involved early on in the construction project uh, to, so we can add value. Um, so there's a lot of commonality across the globe on some of these issues that have been frustrating us uh, for many years. And then looking at um, what the, the international report suggested um, we might actually do about it. Uh, the top one there, uh, education of clients. But of course, education, that's a form of communication, but we also need the evidence uh, to, to communicate to them. And we need to understand how to communicate to them, how to get the message across. You know, what's going to float their boat, as it were? What's going to really grab their attention? And 80% there. Um, second one was, uh, you know, trying to get us involved earlier on in projects. Um, again, it re resonates well with us here in the UK. Um, and that's put down as a potential solution. But how do we convince everybody to do that? Um, it's, uh, it's not proved easy in the past. And then thirdly was promotion of risk management supported by geotechnical risk management case studies and so on. Once again, uh, a communication issue, but also a learning issue. And one of the things that um, was coming across as well was that actually there's not a vast amount of stuff in the literature about this. Because when we actually sol end up solving a problem, we tend to write, write up the problem that we've solved and how we've solved it, not how the risk management process has led us to a particular conclusion and how that risk management process added that value. So if we flip back to the communication side of things to what the insurance industry was saying, there's a, a degree of resonance there again. And I think many people who are ground engineers in the audience, or maybe others who aren't, I don't know, uh, would understand those things and recognize them. So uh, we then looked at um, how re geotechnical risk management contributes to project risk management. You remember the hypothesis was saying that often we're doing it that we're managing geotechnical risk outside project risk. Um, and internationally, um, the message was it's crucial. It's an absolute fundamental part of project risk management. Uh, maybe not in different phases. Of course, we've got to understand that in the very early phases when someone's trying to do a mega financial deal about the new Canary Wharf or something, they're not really too worried about geotechnics. They're worried about international finance and stuff like this. Um, but as you move through and head towards uh, planning and design, and uh, particularly on construction, um, geotechnics, ground engineering becomes more and more important. The second one there was uh, it helps to increase the safety of the works. So there was a, a comment earlier on in here was that uh, um, geotechnical risk management, project risk management, is you know, people like the certainty. They're, they're worried about health and safety and so on. But actually, you can actually hit the health and safety button if you manage risk better. And maybe that message, that linkage, is not quite got across um, from the construction to the construction industry wider in respect of ground risk. And the third one there, 
uh, systematic gathering of geotechnical information along with other information uh, would help to improve the know-how and learn from less past uh, projects. So this is not saying learn geotechnics and then lecture to geotechnical people and we'll all learn together. This is actually joining forces. Um, and we actually should be doing much more uh, cross-profession training so that everybody understands a bit of everybody else's job. Uh, I, had a, I started a new job last year where a chap came downstairs to do my DSE assessment uh, at my workstation. And uh, he was uh, a cost consultant from uh, the floor above me. And I just got chatting and I said, oh, what are you doing uh, now? What are you doing next? He said, well, I'm going to go off and do a master's degree in project ma management. Uh, and the new director who had only arrived that day said, no, you're not. And he looked rather horrified. And I said, you're going to go and do an MSc in program and cost management. If you want to be a project manager, in my view, you need to understand something about every single profession that's in your team so you know how to orchestrate them, you know when to ask them a question, uh, you know when to call on their support um, at whatever stage of the project it happens to be, right the way down to bidding and all the rest of it. Uh, and when I explained what I meant, uh, he looked a bit happier and accepted what I was saying. So there's a general recognition once again there that uh, geotechnical risk management is absolutely key. And if we then look at, uh, just briefly, what is the status of geotechnical risk management, project risk management, I just put up the UK uh, response. Um, and, and that basically is that, given that this was a very, very generic report that really sort of covered everything from uh, house extensions to uh, nuclear power stations, um, basically we've got the full spectrum from uh, full integration down to partial integration, often poor and ad hoc, uh, down to no integration, right the way down to no risk management at all. Uh, and it's when you get down to there, and uh, that tends to be uh, a gradation, I think, in very much in general terms, uh, from large projects down to small projects. Uh, if you talk to the health and safety executive, it's down at the small project end that people start getting killed. And that's where we're not doing the risk management, because uh, the uh, profession is often actually just not even involved. Um, but one thing we also flagged up was that full integration by published procedure does not ensure full integration by process implementation. In other words, just because we've written a standard or something doesn't mean it is actually going to happen. Um, it was interesting running a, a seminar in, in Cardiff uh, back in October 2012, uh, again on construction risk management, not just geotechnics, uh, with various different speakers. We had architect, a QS. Uh, a lawyer as well as geotechnical. Um, and there was a group of, uh, of uh, civil and structural engineers that I, I knew who they were. Uh, they were from a, a very high level governmental body in Wales. Um, no clues. Um, and uh, they asked a question, um, or they put up their hand and, and one of them said, you know, we, we recognize and we've heard uh, probably 80% of what's been said today. We recognize it as good and best practice. I said, are you doing it? They said, no. I said, well, why not? And they looked very sheepishly at each other. And you're thinking, well, if people have got the message that it's a good, good and best practice here, why aren't we doing it? Why is it not happening? And this is some senior people uh, just not uh, getting the, the message. Um, and in communication terms, um, we've not completed, completed the communication. Um, They've got a message, but we have not inspired them to change their practices and do something better. The word inspiration is key in there, in my view. Somehow or other, we have not inspired them to change. So as a, a set of uh, interim conclusions uh, from this uh, piece of work, and as I say, there's a lot more behind this, and you're, you're free to, to read more around the topic uh, with the reports that I've uh, allowed to be published. Um, the first thing is that geotechnical risk management must be considered as integral part of project risk management. Uh, we, we can't be managing things separately. It was interesting, again, at a, a, a small internal uh, workshop at uh, Great George Street, the ICE, um, back, in, back in 2011. Um, I did a bit of a doodle poll in advance of that, and I put up a statement saying a ground engineering problem requires a ground engineering solution. And I asked uh, 
30 or so of the great and good of ground engineering to, to say whether they agreed or whether they disagreed. Um, and 77% said they agreed. Uh, a ground engineering problem does require a ground engineering solution. Um, so I reflected the, this back to them. And uh, Sage nodding around the table, I said, first rule of risk management, avoid the problem. But of course, uh, when I thought about it, I thought, well, why have they responded like that when they actually all know that the first rule of risk management is avoid it? Don't, don't deal with it at all. And I think that uh, part of the reason is that ground engineers are so used to being in the back room, being fed problems to solve by people who actually don't understand geotechnics. They just know there's some problem here, um, whether they be civil structural engineers, architects, lawyers, whoever they happen to be. Um, and we're just so used as an industry, just saying, okay, we'll, we'll solve that problem. But actually, that might not be the best problem to solve to the benefit of the project. You know, maybe we could just move the building, move the road, whatever it might, might be, uh, solve a different problem or solve the whole problem by a non-geotechnical manner that actually adds much more to the uh, value to the project uh, and potentially then to all the parties involved and the societies that are impacted upon by that work. The second one I put down there is that all construction projects should incorporate both geotechnical risk management and project risk management. Now, I know we can all say that when you get down to a very small project, how do you afford that? Um, but you can also look at it from the point of view that if small projects kill people, uh, then maybe that's the place where we should be doing more of it. Um, but how do we actually get the industry to pay attention to that? And how do we get the industry to actually pay uh, for the value that we can create? Third one there was neither of the above statements are universally applied. Um, you know, that, that it just doesn't happen like that. And that's the, the same message from around the world. Um, most of the problems are organizational, not technical. I haven't shown, shown you a single thing in any of the top three of anything that was technical. Uh, so we could look at it and say, well, actually, the, what the message is saying is that as a ground engineering community, we can solve problems. We know how to do that. The issue comes is, is it the right problem? We're doing it in the right way. Uh, that's how the construction industry works, is the implication of what the problem actually is. The next one is basically the current situation, costs. And when I say costs, I don't necessarily mean just money, because it costs lives, it costs all sorts of different ways. It costs time, of course time is money. Um, so th that's a, a universal truth as well. Um, and the last one is quite simply, to many of us, the above is not news. I apologize for all of you who are sitting there thinking, yeah, 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 Paul, when are you going to tell me something new? But this isn't new. The problem is not new. So if we have a look uh, at a bit of UK stuff, we go back to 1994. I know some of you in the audience will recognize this, if not everybody. This is going back to 1994, Mott McDonald and Saw Mechanics. There's a graph there that was drawn up following some research um, of the adjusted site investigation, ground investigation cost, uh, adjusted uh, by uh, the cost of the project uh, against escalation on the y-axis of construction cost. And there seemed to be an upper bound there that seemed to suggest that uh, the smaller amount of money you spent on ground investigation, the higher the, potential, the risk of uh, cost escalation in construction. Uh, and that maybe there was a limit to this uh, exercise. Uh, there is a question mark in front of upper bound, of course, because um, that's a, a limited data set, um, and it could be more. Um, but if you actually do a little bit of an exercise on there, you can see that somewhere around here, is where the m most of projects are, somewhere around the 1% of uh, uh, construction cost. And if I work on a building block of a million pound scheme, uh, that would be 10,000 pounds spent on ground investigation for a million pound scheme. And what that says is that actually there's a risk that the construction cost could escalate to 1.83 million pounds. So there's an 830,000 pound escalation in cost. But if we just spent another £40,000 on ground investigation, you probably see where I'm going on this, we're down to maybe only £250,000 escalation cost. So if you look at that, going back to the problems that people were 
flagging up internationally saying they didn't have an understanding of return on investment. On a, there's a risk-based return on investment there of 14.5 to 1. And I think most people in the finance industry and so on will probably bite your hand off for getting anything like that sort of figure um, for getting their money back. So if you think about what the interest rates are, are like at the moment. Now that's old data. Yeah, it's 20-year-old data. There's a gut feeling amongst most people that I've talked to about that that's probably not far off still being true. But I cannot stand here and say it is true because we haven't updated our research. Uh, we don't know whether that's still the case. That's just a backdrop on 1984. But if we move forward, oh, there's just a, a comment there saying uh, you, you'll always pay for a, a thorough ground investigation as the expensive way and the cheap way. Um, many people will also recognize that expensive way is after you've started construction and you find the problems, the cheap way to do it up front. If you move forward to 2001, we've got the, uh, the seminal work um, by Chris Clayton, uh, geotechnical, uh, managing geotechnical risk. I, I say seminal, um, normally when you say seminal it's, it's resulted in a massive change of practice and a massive improvement. Um, it should have happened, um, but I, I personally don't think it has. But that was flagging up in 2001. Uh, the case records that were available then shows that ground conditions are often the cause of very large cost and time overruns. Again, some of you will recognize that. They're also saying project um, can adversely affect project cost, completion, times, profitability, health and safety, quality, and so on. Again, not news. You go through to 2009. Um, I love the title of this, uh, this publication, Never Waste a Good Crisis. Um, whoever came up with that one should get an award. Uh, but this was a review of the progress since the Rethinking Construction Agenda, um, uh, going back to the Latham and Egan reports and so on. And it says for the last decade, this is uh, uh, the 2000s when for the most of that decade actually we were um, in pretty good times, it's fair to say. Uh, the industry has been sheltered by a healthy economy. This has enabled construction to prosper without having to strive for innovation. The current economic crisis is a perfect opportunity for us to think again. We cannot afford to waste it. Um, and my view is that, yes, the Chris Clayton's report should have been a seminal report, but actually, it, it, you know, if the industry had followed it, but the industry didn't follow it. And the information that's coming back, um, admittedly, in a, in a manner that's not comprehensively researched in a proper manner and so on, and it's an element of anecdotal stuff here, and I fully accept the, the limitations of the research that's been uh, undertaken to date. But the anecdotal evidence that's coming back, not just from the UK, but from worldwide, is actually we've still got a problem. Ground engineering can do more uh, for the construction sector. We can add more value to the society and the, the communities that we impact upon by the work that we do. And then also in 2009, uh, GeoImpulse uh, was uh, created. GeoImpulse is a, a Dutch initiative, a public and private sector collaborative effort, uh, fully funded, 6.5 million euros. Uh, they had to actually look into this similar sort of problem. Now, many of us, and certainly I, when I first met with them, I thought, well, why are the Dutch getting so hot about this? Surely they're pretty good at managing geotechnical risk with all the, the dikes and all the rest of it. You'd have thought, well, they must be pretty good, so why are they so worried about it? But in fact, they were saying, no, no, we're, we're, not, we're not good at it. We've got construction failure left, right, and center. We've got problems with the ground. And actually, when we showed them Chris Clayton's report and started discussing that, they actually said, well, you're ahead of us. Uh, you know more about it. You thought more about this. Um, and we were saying, well, we're still terrible. We're still worried about it, and so on. So I think, what's going on here? Um, but if you take some of their data, what they said is they invest, uh, as a, a country, about 50 billion euros per annum. Construction cost, uh, failure cost was about 10%. Ground-related failure cost was about 5% of that. So we're talking about, uh, um, and they were targeting by next year, um, savings of about 2.5%. Uh, they wanted to halve that figure. And they were trying to look at uh, all sorts of angles on this. Um, technical solutions, project management solutions, risk management solutions, how the team worked together and so on. Uh, quite a lot of different strands they've been looking at. But if you actually convert those figures uh, to um, uh, figures that you could, uh, that were certainly banded about for the UK National Infrastructure Plan, talking about 250 billion pound investment over five years, 
So we're talking about ground-related failure costs of £12.5 billion. And if we could halve that, that's if that data can be extrapolated from the Netherlands to us, um, we'd be targeting savings of £6.25 billion. Uh, and the question's got to be asked, what could we do with an extra £6.25 billion? Um, I tend to look at this and say, well, actually, if you give £1.25 billion uh, to the ground engineering fraternity to, to really do the job properly, uh, we'll take the other £5 billion back off the legal profession uh, who've been uh, arguing the case for everybody while they're in dispute. Uh, and we could spend £5 billion on things that are much more valuable to uh, society at large uh, than paying lawyers but maybe I'm being facetious. Um, I just wanted to touch then on uh, the UK country report conclusions, and these are uh, identical to the ones I floated uh, at the BGA talk I gave last May. Um, there's an issue of ri fuzzy risk terminology, I've called it. Uh, even the word risk, um, there isn't one definition. Uh, there's an Oxford English definition, which is pretty much the same as the Royal Society, which is different from the International Standards Organization. Uh, the, the Oxford English Royal Society basically only has risk management to do with negative outcomes and reducing negative outcomes, whereas the International Standards Organization starts talking about the potential for positive outcomes, what I'd like to think of as opportunity management as opposed to risk management. Um, so there's a, an issue there where um, maybe there's a bit of fuzziness there. The other issue, when I brought various different professions together in this uh, room and also down in Cardiff, I had hoped that um, there'd be a common language between architects and geotechnical people and geologists and engineers and so on, and that that language might be called risk. Um, and what I found out, um, which maybe shouldn't have been too much of a surprise, was really, yes, there is a common language. We're all talking risk. Unfortunately, we're all talking different dialects. Um, so we actually can't quite understand each other, and our definitions are slightly different. Um, so we're maybe lacking some common ground there. So I think we've got some <laughs> issue in just understanding each other. Um, there's a, a lack of risk-focused evidence. I've mentioned that before. Um, uh, the standards. Uh, are not focused on value-added inputs and beneficial outcomes. Once again, go back to my 2011 doodle poll. Um, uh, when I uh, put up the statement that uh, geotechnical standards are all predicated on value-adding inputs and beneficial outcomes, I had 100% of respondents said, no, they're not. And that begs the question, well, why not? You know, what are our standards for if we're not looking to try and improve outcomes? Um, the risk is always there, and I've had this problem myself, that you write the standards. Um, HD22 is an example, managing geotechnical risk on highway schemes. Working with uh, the Welsh Government, civil and structural engineers, um, they keep kept on saying to me, um, can we have a flowchart? Can we have a flowchart? Because actually they thought, well, we're engineers. If we follow the flowchart, we'll get the answer right. And I said, well, actually, geotechnical risk management isn't a simple flowchart. It's more like snakes and ladders. Um, and uh, actually, if you want me to write a flowchart, it'll simply say, have you got a geotechnical problem? If the answer is yes, employ a geotechnical specialist. If the answer is no, get on with life. Um, so uh, that wasn't going to help them very much. But th there was this mentality that uh, we could just follow the process and out would pop the value. And actually, no, you have to actually champion value. Um, and the process will drop out, and the audit trail and so on will drop out afterwards. Uh, lack of risk-competent resources. Um, maybe not enough people who really understand risk, and I might even include myself in that uh, bucket as well. Uh, Non-ideal training and educational approaches. Uh, I ran the 10th annual conference um, or seminar, 10th, uh, um, sorry, anniversary of Richard Clayton, uh, Chris Clayton's report being uh, issued. Um, and uh, I invited all MSc students at uh, Cardiff University uh, Geology uh, to uh, to join in. I said to the teachers, I said, this will be a useful complement to your risk module. And they said, what risk module? We don't teach risk. We teach soil mechanics and rock mechanics and so we don't teach risk. I said, well, hang on a minute. That's the language, in effect, of the industry that they're about to join. Uh, they're going to look pretty damn stupid in interview if they're asked a risk question and they haven't got a clue what you're talking about. Um, so uh, I, I've tried to help them and I've done a, a short module um, 
a short lecture every year for them since. Um, Team attitudes are not always right and can be negatively influenced by poor contracts. Uh, going back to the procurement ideas, um, procurement uh, often got the idea that um, you know, cheapest price is, is best value and all the rest of it. Um, and often they've got the contracts written by people who don't actually understand geotechnics, so they don't know to include it or anything, or to give it the right status. And then the uh, inability to understand our audiences and how best to communicate with them. Uh, this is sort of touching on more sort of social sciences and team science. Uh, people um, respond differently. Um, I'll give you a very extreme and simplified example. If you want to get a piece of information across to an engineer, show him a graph. If you want to get it over the same piece of knowledge over to an architect, show him a picture. Um, that's an extreme generalization and apologies to both engineers and architects by that comment. Um, but you need to communicate differently to the different audience. You need to know how to uh, inspire. And, and maybe we've, uh, we've struggled with that. Um, and in fact, we're probably struggling also because we're spending a lot of time, and maybe today is another example, uh, lecturing to people who actually already get the problem, rather than managing to lecture to architects and civil engineers and so on. Uh, the trouble is that if I'd given this title and asked all architects to come along, uh, the audience would have been zero because they would have just looked at it and said, that's not for me, that's for the ground people, you know, the people in the back room at the back. Um, and we simply uh, wouldn't be getting the message across. So that we've got to find a way of, uh, of, of improving that interaction between professions. So uh, the last bit here was, you know, well, why do we still have a perceived problem? And I say perceived guardedly simply because you know, there could be a lot of data we could still collect to go and prove that this issue is as bad as maybe it uh, is implied by my lecture here. Um, and and I, I, I quite like this one. Uh, I, I've taken a quote here, the problem is not the problem, the problem is your attitude about the problem, and I've changed it slightly um, to read the problem is not the problem, the problem is our attitude about the problem. Um, and part of the reason why I like that is that's uh, Paul Maliphant after Johnny Depp, um, Captain Jack Sparrow, Pirates of the Caribbean. Which is just, I just felt good about doing that. Um, but it's our approach. It's what we're doing about it. It's how we're, how we're dealing with something. A lot of what I've said is not news, I don't think, to many of you here. But the fact that it's not news, and maybe I could have given this talk 20 years ago, and everybody would have been saying, yeah, yeah, got that. The fact that I'm still giving the talk and it's still perceived as a problem says that we've failed. We've failed as a ground engineering fraternity to inspire those that can make a difference to change the way that construction uh, teams work and how they use our skills. Uh, and that's a problem. And I'd rather move to an area where we're not quite so frustrated with life. So just finally, some thoughts, hopefully, to just trigger a bit of a discussion here, um, is some thoughts on what should we do about that, this in the 2010s. You know, what should we try and do uh, differently? And I say this is a debate. This is just a few ideas from uh, uh, from me. Uh, I have others, but this is just a few of them. But we are talking about things that one individual cannot solve on his own. So the first one I've put up there is update our research on the value of geotechnical risk management to demonstrate return on investment. If the industry worldwide is saying, we don't get it, we want to talk in pounds, shillings, and pence, if you go back pre-1971, um, we want to understand that it's really worth it, and we understand money. Of course, you can do return on investment through carbon. Probably want to understand that as well, but I think currently uh, money is king. Um, we could also do return on investment on lives saved and stuff like this, but I think the principal one here is money. They want to know that if they spend a little bit of money uh, on more ground investigation, bringing geotechnical people in early in a project, that they're actually going to get a return on that investment. Because if they've got no return, they might as well carry on doing what they're doing, accepting that they're going to have problems during construction that's going to cost a bit of money, and get on with life. Um, but we don't want that to happen, not least of all because we don't want disasters to happen because that's always the risk. What we're trying to do is reduce things like Aberfan ever happening again. 
think, a, a good Welsh example of a, a mining-related but construction-related uh, issue that went terribly wrong. Another thought was uh, to hold a symposium in print or similar on the value of the risk management process with best value examples. If the industry is saying, look, you know, we've got a lot of case studies that actually uh, talk about how you solve the problem, but virtually nothing on actually how the risk management process allowed you to come to the conclusion that that was the best thing to do, then maybe we haven't got that message across. Or maybe we haven't got it across to ourselves. Everybody says we've got to manage the risks and so on. But if we haven't got enough evidence to show that it's worthwhile, then maybe it's just adding to the difficulties of trying to convince anybody that we should be doing something different. Another one there, make best use of the UK register of ground engineering professionals. Uh, in uh, Chris Clayton's report, he talks about three principal risks, uh, the nature of the ground, the geometry of the ground, and an incompetent professional. Um, the UK register is aiming uh, to get to the position where the, the industry, if it so wishes, clients, if they so wish, uh, can put in contracts saying, I want, we want uh, a UK registered ground, investigation, ground engineering advisor in the team. We want the team to be on that register because they've proved that they know how to do this. Uh, we're not there yet. We haven't got enough people on that register for the industry really to make best use of it. But there's an opportunity for the industry to manage that one risk out of three. Championing leadership positions for ground engineers in project teams. Uh, I've been very fortunate working on a major road scheme uh, a few years ago, uh, particularly when we went through a major uh, value engineering exercise and I ended up involved in the, uh, embedded in that team. I wasn't just doing ground engineering, I was actually responsible for all earthworks design, all drainage design, ecology, environmental management, um, and the independent checking of the major structure on the, on the site. So I got quite heavily involved in it, maybe a position that uh, was quite uh, novel in some respects for a geologist to get involved in. And I learned a heck of a lot by that process. And I managed to get into a, uh, what I like to think of as a leadership position. I could influence what we were doing through value engineering. Um, but I, 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 d I don't think often that ground engineers are in that position to actually influence the progress of a project. Simple one here, improve uh, procurement and contractual practice. That's been touched on before, so I won't dwell on it. Um, design to add value and capture opportunities, not just follow due process. If all we're doing is just saying, well, this is the way it's always been done, I'm going to do it this way, uh, we're not champion, championing uh, best value. Um, and risk management, as I mentioned earlier on, is mostly looking at negative outcomes and trying to reduce them. Whereas if you actually look at opportunity management, you may be trying to maximize the benefits of something. Uh, I did a lecture earlier on this afternoon on social value planning. Um, slightly different from what I'm doing this evening. Um, but that was all about uh, how, by our actions, we can enhance the economic, social, and environmental well-being of the communities in the specific area that we're doing a job. Some of that might be trying to design so that the local supply chain could be involved during construction or consultancy or design um, to employ local people and so on. So bringing that sort of uh, thought into ground engineering uh, side of things. Um, often something I, I suspect that when we're designing a ground engineering solution to a ground engineering problem, we're maybe not actually thinking that, uh, those sides of things. Learn to how to communicate inspirationally. I've mentioned earlier on we haven't inspired. Um, I don't know whether I'm inspiring anything tonight. Um, but it, you know, if we haven't inspired, if we've got a message across, but they're not doing it, we haven't inspired. In many cases, I don't think we've even got the message across. Uh, or there's a new uh, cohort of architects graduating and so on, and they don't know anything about ground, ground risk at all. They don't realize the problem, so they've not been trained properly. Uh, or for that matter, ground engineers who don't know enough about architecture and how projects are led and so on to understand how they can actually influence things. Um, so communication 
understanding the audience, understanding how to inspire that particular audience is an issue. Uh, so speaking inspirationally to fellow professionals and not just fellow ground engineers. Um, once again, I'll say the problem is actually trying to get the non-ground engineers actually in the room to listen to a talk on geotechnics uh, is actually quite difficult. Um, and update risk, uh, risk and opportunity management teaching in universities. Um, and I'd like to stress the and opportunity again. That's my thoughts. I'll stop talking now. Uh, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of a discussion. Uh, because we're recording this, we have... Uh, um, got a microphone that will rove around um, and Tom will deliver it to anybody who has a question. I will stay here by these microphones if you don't mind. Thank you, Paul. Uh, any questions in the room? David. David Norbury. Uh, Interesting that um, for one of your, your several stumbling blocks you uh, referred to, one of the uh, early stumbling blocks is the lack of common language. Yes. And surely this is absolutely, well, it is fundamental, you've raised it. Um, it's not only this field we have these problems in, but what can we do about sort of trying to improve the commonality of the language? It's not just a matter of writing a dictionary, is it? It's much deeper than that. I, I, I think it is deeper than that. Uh, I think um, the fact that the International Standards Organization wrote something which tried to change the definition of risk to uh, allow uh, positive outcomes uh, suggested that someone there was thinking, how can I change the way we do things uh, in, in that small area? Um, the fact that, as far as I can tell, nobody's paying any attention to that definition of, of risk management from the International Standards Organization uh, tells you something that they failed as well. Um, but we are talking, uh, I, I accept, I think we probably all accept that there, uh, in different professions will be looking at things through different glasses and have different ideas about things. So there are bound to be some differences. Um, but yes, if we all know that, you know, what hazard means, what risk means, if, if all of us know that actually if, if we can define a risk, we can manage it. Um, there was one of the slides about, uh, earlier on was talking about a risk-averse culture. Uh, to me, that's just because people don't want or can't or whatever manage the risks. It's not that they can't be managed. Uh, all risks can be managed and mitigated. Maybe not as far as we'd like all the time, but they can be. Um, they're not all, you know, people don't try. Uh, they just say, well, that's too hard, I'll move that away. Um, so th there's a massive cultural change. If we want to have a common language and a common way of talking across all the professions that get involved in construction, um, it's going to take a heck of a long time to get there. Um, th this is in no shape or form uh, something that can be fixed by, as you say, uh, Dr. Johnson coming along, coming out with a new dictionary of risk management, because we'll have all the oldies like thee and me uh, who will carry on with the way that we always think because that's the way it is. And then we'll get the youngsters coming through with the different definitions, uh, and then they'll be shouted down by their seniors because they say, no, no, that's not the way to do it. it, it it's going to take a long time. That's a, that, we're talking about a generational thing if it could ever be achieved. Unfortunately. Any more questions here in the room? Uh, Eugene Gallagher. Uh, Paul, how would you know uh, what a risk competent geo professional looks like? How would they know? How would we know when they're, they've arrived? Now, there's a challenge. Um, I suppose the UK Register of Ground Engineering Professionals is attempting to do that. Um, risk is one of the key competencies that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, that's peer reviewed. Um, of course, we're talking then about uh, ground engineering peers reviewing ground engineers. Uh, so that still doesn't mean that they actually un they understand geotechnical risk, but do they understand project risk? Do they understand how geotechnical risk influences project risk? Um, I, I think we've probably got a fairly broad spread of people even on, uh, currently on the register now at advisor level with regard to their totality of understanding. And of course everybody's working in different sectors as well. And different sectors are dealing with things slightly differently. Highways doing things differently to 
nuclear power, they're doing different things to flood risk management. There's, there's different drivers, some of them are institutional, some of them projects, some of them are money, some of them are, are carbon, all different drivers in there. Um, I don't think it's easy to understand, uh, well, I don't know personally how to understand in totality whether someone is totally risk competent. Um, but even if they were risk competent, is the system set up to allow those competencies to come to the fore and add the value that they could do? Because if you, you can be as competent as you like, but if the system doesn't let you do it, um, you know, those Welsh government officials saying, you know, they recognise it, but they don't do it. If the system somehow is stopping you, you'll be as good as you like. You won't add the value that you, you want to and need to. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Simon, Simon Holt. I think it's uh, interesting that, uh, you know, 30 years have passed since the um, graph was produced, you know, by yourselves and, uh, and soil mechanics. And um, I think the only way we can really convince clients is to, you know, stress the, the value that um, sound ground investigation and uh, early geotechnical involvement brings to projects. Uh, I would personally welcome the, uh, the symposium in print if we could show real case studies and uh, prove the value. I think that uh, is the only way really to communicate it across to clients and um, fellow professionals in other disciplines. Do you think it's uh, you know, reality? You know, can we uh, do such a thing? I, I don't see any reason why we can't. And uh, as I'm the meeting secretary of, uh, of the engineering group of the Geological Society, um, it is something I've already floated. Uh, tonight on the train back to Cardiff, I might be writing uh, a draft of the 2015 program, which might include some such uh, in that general area. I certainly have some interest uh, from others in that area, particularly the likes of, uh, of Jim Clifford down at Plymouth University. Uh, he's already voiced a, an interest in that. So yes, we uh, we can try and uh, pull something together. But um, one of the things that worries me, and when I uh, had held uh, the first workshop on this back in uh, 2011, um, there was uh, commentary coming back saying, well, we've got to make sure our facts are right, we've got to make sure our facts are right, because the data's you know, out of date. And I was thinking, well, how long are we going to wait to make sure that we've got the data right to go and prove something? And uh, uh, one quote I've used before is a, a quote, I've uh, probably not got the words quite right, from Albert Einstein, uh, which was, uh, try not to um, be a success try to add value. Uh, and this is one of those problems where I think if we actually tried to define what success was, we'd never start on the journey. So whilst we might want to go and get more data and pull it together and do some proper research to update our records, I don't think we should wait for that uh, if we possibly can. We should be trying to do something now with the data that we've got. Um, we've got some more recent data, admittedly I'm extrapolating from Holland to say I think this could be the same here. Um, uh, uh, but it was interesting uh, even taking that data when I was talking to the, um, I think he's the uh, policy officer of uh, the RICS, when I started talking to him about geotechnical risk management and so on, I could see his eyes starting to glaze and he was twitching towards the door trying to leave from the seminar I'd uh, been at. Um, when I then started using those numbers, how much we could save, uh, and so on, and put it in pounds, shillings, and pence, he stopped twitching and he suddenly was listening. And he actually, I was at another event the other day, and he actually came up and sought me out um, to have a chat about it and see whether uh, actually we could get together and do something. So that was an element of, you know, data that I wasn't 100% certain about, um, but I managed to get the right language to catch his attention and maybe inspire him just that little bit so that maybe we could start talking to surveyors. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, th I think we, I'd, I'd like to do something. Uh, a symposium in print is not something which I can put on next week. Um, you know, putting it on in 12 months' time is probably going to be hard work um, uh, in organising it all, but I think that something could well be done. Uh, and on the communication side, which is another element of the uh, of the issue. I have had some discussions uh, with uh, Professor Ian Stewart, also down at uh, Plymouth University, because he does a lot of work, as you may well know, uh, on geocommunication with the public. Uh, and this is just geocommunication.
communication with fellow professionals. Um, so it's an allied issue. I did try and get a PhD student lined up with him, but unfortunately we couldn't get the money. Um, but uh, some of this maybe is, is white for uh, a few PhDs around, if we can find the money to actually do some of the research as we go along as well. There's, there's lots of different ways I think we could possibly sit down and try and say, well, we might be able to make some progress if we did this. And I'd like to think if we start um, trying to do things differently than we've done before, because clearly what we've done to date hasn't worked, if we try something different and try and move towards what might be an end goal, um, we'll slowly, uh, slowly success over the next decades, I fear to say, might come slowly into focus, uh, probably well, well beyond the end of my career, uh, that we'll really get to the point where ground engineers feel that they are as valued as much as they should be. Another question? Um, Paul, just a couple of things that I've become aware of in recent practice, and I wonder whether you have any comment. The one is a couple of larger projects where a competency matrix has been required. Um, I, and, and in fact, interviews with the discipline leaders to assess their competence, and then they are tasked with uh, um, providing uh, evidence of the competence of the rest of their team. And I wonder whether that's common in international practice or common in your experience and whether you have any, any, any comment. And um, within my own new employer, um, they, we have uh, projects have to be managed by certified project managers. And the experience of the project manager, in fact, has a weighting on the risk assessment for the project. And again, I wonder if this is the sort of thing which might help to take us forward and improve the situation. My gut feeling is your first question relates to a major tender that's currently uh, out to tender. It does, two completed projects. Oh, all right, okay, because there's, there's a current major framework which is uh, currently being tendered, which is, uh, I think, working along the same sort of lines. Um, uh, I'm not too sure that it is uh, a, a regular thing to actually have the competency assessed as part of the procurement process. It's more a question of prove that you've got the qualifications that that your peers have said that you're competent. Um, but as I've said, you know, the, the UK Register of Ground Engineering Professionals, uh, I think, is, is set up to try and make a difference. Um, but being able to manage geotechnical risk management does not necessarily say you can influence project risk management, which actually may have bigger benefits for society. Um, and with regard to the internal uh, competencies, uh, I, I think the major consultancies are turning more to the competency assessments. Uh, I think lots of different people have got different ways of doing it. Uh, my experience of an attempt to do competency risk management uh, uh, a couple of years ago um, with a, a major reorganization in the company I used to work for, um, unfortunately they seem to assume that if you'd worked on a big project you were competent, if you'd only worked on small projects you were less competent. Um, actually I don't think that works because you can be highly competent with a lot of experience on small projects and be able to bring that to the bigger. Um, so I, I think their competency assessment was flawed. Uh, and I don't think, uh, from what I've seen of it, that it's an easy science uh, to sort of independently assess competence. Another way of looking at this, uh, I remember talking to uh, Paul Cools from uh, Geo Impulse, um, and their figures showed that, um, uh, you know, how much been uh, uh, failure costs were uh, in construction and I said well um, you know you're talking about an element of how you know people being you know, with more competence dealing with these things would have, would have, would have done things better um, but uh, if those competent people are, are actually solving the wrong problem um, we could have actually solved the problem fine you know we built something hasn't fallen down hasn't killed anybody hunky dory isn't it um, but actually, if that was £10 million more expensive than the alternative that we never thought of because we weren't competent to manage risks in an in a, a inclusive and in, uh, uh, manner, then we've still got something that hasn't worked. Uh, unfortunately, that last uh, example is totally unmeasurable. Uh, there's no way the construction industry has uh, a record of how much things cost and how much things could have cost if we designed them differently. 
we just don't have that data. Any more questions here? One more question there. I'll make this one the other last one because it's getting into time now. So. Hello, I'm nice. Athena. Um, I've worked in Australia for six years on large alliance projects. Um, and in regard to procurement, uh, leadership teams were actually subjected to psychological tests to see how they actually work together in a group. Um, and actually, for two of the projects, that uh, determined who won the project. Um, so people are assessing competency and how people work together in that way. Um, and we, with alliances, they have this no blame culture and actually have culture training for alliancing. And they also have people who um, are allocated leaders who do culture 101 and everybody in all cross disciplines, construction, drainage, geologists, engineers, um, ecologists, everybody gets involved in the risk management. Uh, all risks, anything that's foreseeable, anything that sounds ridiculous is all put into the risk register. Those are discussed and how it could affect different disciplines. And then the other disciplines will also then speak on how that could affect them. Um, and that's then taken forward. And we also have opportunity registers where any time of the day, if you think of anything, that any developments, you put it in the opportunity register and it gets captured. And um, on loads of projects where we've gone into construction, we've had so many opportunities used um, that it's been a real success. Um, and yeah, so that's that's what's been happening on the other side of the world. Well, I'm, Australia didn't feed into this uh, this study, um, but I'm absolutely delighted to hear that uh, people are more uh, enlightened down under, certainly in some areas. Clearly, um, I think the idea of uh, assessments to see how teams are working uh, could well be valuable. Uh, of course, what often happens is you bid with one team and then you switch it because you want something else and then the team that's actually delivering is maybe not quite the same one. Um, that's that's an additional challenge. Um, but if you go back to the uh, insurance issue, uh, you know, if you've got a highly competent team that's communicating well, we'll solve anything you like uh, and we'll, we'll do the best, uh, uh, the best job. Um, I went to a lecture on Monday night by Sir John Arnold, uh, who headed up delivery of the Olympics, um, where they managed to spend whatever it was, nine billion pounds. I think they came in a billion pound after eight billion pounds, and the worst accident was a broken leg. Um, they knew how to manage projects uh, and bring in the, uh, uh, the different professions in, in the right way. Um, it can be done, and in some areas, I think it is done. Um, but when you look at it from the perspective of what I've been uh, feeding into, which is, uh, as I say, all the way from uh, house extensions to nuclear power stations, the general picture is actually we're not as good as we like to think we are, and there is a long way to go to, to get to something where we think actually we're firing on all cylinders. And if we can learn something from Australia, uh, I'd, love to, I'd love to know more. And with regard opportunity management, my own company, we do risk and opportunity registers. Everything is risk and opportunity registers. Uh, and when I joined them last year, I thought that was actually quite refreshing because I wasn't used to that. Uh, something that I'd been uh, sort of shouting about, I suddenly found a company that was actually already doing it. So maybe we can all learn from each other even within the UK. Thanks, Paul. I think we'll uh, call it to an end there. Thanks for uh, this interesting talk, which hopefully will uh, work some action going forward and actually sort of get people spurred up to, inspired to take it forward further. So I um, just uh, ask everyone to thank Paul in the usual way. Thank you.